Lord forgive me for this trap shit. Sergeant Smack making backflip. Telly Hank it with the action. With the vital speaking Spanish. Frank Matthews, how I vanish. Poof. Came back like I'm King Tut. Gold BBS is on a beamer. When Fat Cat was tearing queens up. Fall off the prop and not the re up. Fly like Puerto Rican Jesus. Uptown like I'm Baby Man. Just caught a touchdown. You know, I, can, I always go and visit Lou and Tut and all those guys mm -hmm. in school, and I always say, um, I should be in here with them. Hey, Clinton! That was Bill Clinton on the receiving end of some harsh words last night. Clinton was in Watts, California, campaigning at a restaurant for his wife. The criticism came from a woman in the crowd who was upset about the former president signing a controversial federal crime bill in 1994 that created lengthy sentences for many drug offenses. It wouldn't only be drug dealers that would feel the effects of that controversial law signed by Bill in 1994. Today, I'm going to tell y'all the story of a man and his significance to two groundbreaking events that would occur in that very same year of 1994 that would go on to seal his fate. Can we get grimy for a second? Streets. Let's go. A lot of things popping off. Uh, there was a situation a couple years ago with, uh, you know, with some of your people, Jimmy Henchman's people. Yeah. This dude is currently looking at well, never seen here you come back. A beach. <laughs> they got him. Yeah. Again. So, I mean, like, I mean, so is this stuff that you kind of always knew that was going on? I mean, I just keep the street stuff, you know, off the wraps. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, what, now, what about this stuff with him setting up Tupac? Did you know about that? Well, yeah, because I had conversations with Tut. Got you. You know what I mean? So, the parties involved or, or in the circle, even. People at the company know. So is there some more things that you think we're going to find out within the next, I don't know, but five But th those weeks? things that matter. Like even the kid, the reason why you know this is because old boy made a statement. He said, you know, and apologized to Pac Mom, mm -hmm. you know, for actually doing it. Because he said he gave him a few dollars to do it, like $25, something like that. Let me ask y'all something. Out of all of the names that we've grown to know that ring off the concrete, from New York City street law. How many can y'all name that will go on to carve out a reputation or make a name for themselves when drugs or drug dealing is rarely ever mentioned? Today, we would call them the jack boys, the takers, or the robbers. Back then, they were called the stick up kids. And it would be one by the name of Walter King Tut Johnson that would go on to be one of the most prolific to come out of the city. His criminal career would begin long before 1994, growing up in Cypress Hill, which is in the East New York section of Brooklyn. Cypress would also be the home to other notable names to come out of the city. Guys like Puerto Rican Jesus, Glaze, and even the notorious 18. He would be born in the early 1960s and raised in a Jehovah Witness household, but it seems like very early on he made the choice that that wasn't the way that he wanted to go, and it was said that he was in the streets by his early teenage years. Now, the religion I've seen people come up under just growing up in Brooklyn makes me wonder if that might have contributed to his path, because though the religion seemed strict, not sure what the climate was in the 1970s, but just growing up in Brooklyn, being a Jehovah's Witness can put you in some compromising situations. Now just imagine you at a door with your mother who's devoted to this religion that she's teaching you and she's telling you to knock and one of your classmates open. Now not to say that this had any effect on the situation or Brooklyn is the most insensitive place in the world, but sometimes that's the type of shit that will come up in school. By his teenage years, he was said to have joined a robbing crew who, just like him throughout his criminal career, would go on to rob anything from supermarkets to drug dealers. And he would still be in his teenage years when the myth surrounding his name would begin. 
Now, I can't exactly remember if it was before 1994, but I do distinctively remember hearing the name King Tut. And to be honest with you, it's almost so synonymous in Brooklyn. At that time, people would just refer to him as Tut. And the thing that would be mentioned the most would be rumors of an infamous robbery that would occur at a witness hall, which would be the meeting place for the people under the Jehovah's Witness faith, where, according to rumor, he would go on to rob hundreds of worshipers, including his mother, relieving them of cash and jewelry. And to be honest with you, it sounded a lot like an article the New York Times would publish in June of 1982, titled Gunmen Take $1,200 at Religious Meeting. The article would explain how three armed men would burst their way into the meeting hall, where they would go on to take an estimated $1,200 in cash, saying that they were wearing ski masks, carrying pistols, abruptly interrupting the service at about 8.30 p.m. at the hall located on 450 Fountain Avenue in the East New York section of Brooklyn. Tut would go on to find himself behind bars during the beginning of the crack era, but would be released in the late 1980s to what I'm sure seemed like a different world, with people that was probably broke when he went in getting paper and all the money floating around from the emergence of the crack game. I'm sure he probably came out licking his chops. And it is my belief that the beginning of his downfall would start in 1993, a year before his name would go on to live in infamy. Just a few days after the new year in mid-January of 1993, Tut, along with two other individuals, one being Gerald Gary, the other being unnamed, would find themselves in a shootout with plainclothes police officers with authorities claiming that the trio was in the process of robbing Eddie's unisex barbershop in the East New York section of Brooklyn. Tut would go on to be acquitted of the shooting that would see everybody involved, the two people that he was allegedly with and the two plainclothes officers shot except for him. But it would be a series of robberies after that acquittal and two earth-shaking events that would be the writing on the wall for King Tut. the bickering stops the era of excuses is over the law-abiding citizens of our country have made their voices heard never again should Washington put politics and party above law and order from this day forward let us put partisanship behind us and let us go forward Democrats Republicans and independents law enforcement community leaders ordinary citizens let us roll up our sleeves to roll back this awful tide of violence and reduce crime in our country. We have the tools now. Let us get about the business of using them. Whether Tut knew it or not, just hundreds of miles from streets that he terrorized for years, the 42nd president was signing a bill aimed at targeting drugs and drug dealers that would affect him and hundreds of people to come. So that what happened in the 1990s is the transition from lock them up to throw away the key. This is a third strike case. While in most states, all three strikes had to be violent or serious crimes, in California, the third strike was unique. I told y'all about how many people the law would affect. Now, let me tell y'all about a specific case. Meet Jerry Dwayne Williams, a convicted felon from California. He would receive a 25 to life prison sentence in March of 1995 for the theft of a slice of pepperoni pizza from a group of children. 
his previous felonies would be for robbery, attempted robbery, unauthorized use of a motor vehicle, and possession of a controlled substance. Now, if they was giving out that type of time, like a slice of pizza, to a petty criminal, what do you think they had in mind for guys like Tut? And then you have that issue that put him on the federal radar. And finally, the night he was shot in the lobby of Quad Studios on November 30th, 1994, a hotspot for rap artists at the time. That's Sean Diddy Combs outside as police arrived on scene. He was shot numerous times, at least twice in the head. When I got, when them, when them dudes put out the pistols to me, man, who was that, man? It was these fools from New York, this gang out there called A-Team. These man. fools was mad because I, I told them I wasn't fucking with them no more. Man, them motherfuckers, I was mad as hell about that shit. But when, I, when they pulled the pistols out, I swear on everything I love, first thing I thought about was reading in your book when you was talking about how you felt when them niggas drew down on you. Ain't that cold? exactly how I felt. The setup, the shit you was talking man, about, the shit. how you just look up and the nigga be like, boom. Half of New York is commenting on me getting shot. And before, they was all like, we didn't see nothing. Everybody knew what I did. They knew what I said. I was acting. Who gets shot five times and acts? Oh, I didn't get shot five times in their vision. I only got shot once because they found the bullet. The police found the bullet. Now they the cops. Now they doing detective work. They found the bullet. Oh, you found the bullet, huh? So what is this other shit in me then? What was the doctors talking about? Almost immediately after being shot, and subsequently arrested on sexual assault charges. In a series of phone calls and letters home from behind a wall, Tupac would go on to name several high-profile street figures in a plot to assault, rob, or assassinate the rapper, naming Haitian Jack as the alleged mastermind, with Jimmy Henchman being involved and Tut playing a role as shooter. So many different theories have emerged from that night in November, almost 30 years ago with one of the most popular being the confession slash admission from Dexter Isaac. There's not many people that know the actual facts of that night. Some people believe that Tupac was speaking the truth in those phone calls and in those letters, while others believe that he would use the shooting in an impending beef with Notorious Big as a publicity stunt. Regardless of that, the situation would escalate even more when Tupac would go on to join Death Row and release the iconic Machiavelli Seven Day Theory album, where on the final track of the project, a song titled Against All Odds, Tupac would go on to rap. Now you gotta watch your back, watch your front, here we come, gunshots to Tut, now you stuck. Tut would go on to deny being the man that shot Tupac, but just as he believed, I believe that the incident would put him on the radar of the feds. In an interview, he would mention that they believed that he was involved and they wanted him to snitch, even asking him about information on other entertainers. With him not breaking the code, that essentially sealed his fate. He was picked up by U.S. Marshals while leaving court, where the state would go on and drop robbery charges against him. Ironically, it would occur just a week after Tupac would be shot for the second time on the Vegas Strip, resulting with him losing his life. Now y'all make sure y'all hit the red bell and subscribe button right under this video so y'all know when this real trill spill shit is dropping. Definitely get down there let me know the names of the people that made a name for themselves without using a pack. I got a few of mine. Uh, we talked about one Haitian Jack, 50 Cent. Got two or three more, but I want to see what y'all got. Y'all let me know what cities we need to go to, what stories we need to tell, what we missed, what we got wrong. Y'all hit me directly, Instagram, Twitter, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. And until the next play, y'all know the rules. Shades pop a lot. Salute the almighty mob.